the hot fun in the summertime. Welcome back to the Deliver More Show. This is a really cool uh, experience. We're in a new space. I'm joined by uh, the founder of Intech MKT, Francesca Vavila. Hello. And as always, Mike Patterson. It's good to see you, my man. Good to be seen. Good to see you guys. Yeah. Back in the saddle. How's right? the how's the summertime going? It's going. It's, yeah. You know, it's already moving along. We're into August now. Yeah. Can, um, can I ask if it's hot enough for you? It's never hot. Please don't. I love summertime, <laughs> so he doesn't bother me. Please don't ask if it's hot. Spoken like for somebody you. at the beach. <laughs> Or not at the beach, of course. I'd, I'd be remiss uh, if on behalf of the audience, who I act for uh, all the time and represent. Mike, we're in a new location, my man. Uh, just are. tell the audience a little bit about what's going on. So we are live from the Florogistics office. Uh, as everyone knows, Intech was acquired on April 30th. We are in the home office of Florogistics in Greenville, Delaware, very close to where we all live. So this is a convenient... It's quite convenient. Yeah, yeah. it's very nice. <laughs> uh, but we are taking a different look here. Obviously, our studio is no longer, and we've set up a new spot. We want to just get down home in the office, kind of leave things as they are. You know, you yeah. see the fish tank, you see some plants, the furniture. These comfy leather chairs, yeah. no big table. I, I want to hear some comments on what the, what people think of the new setup I'd if like they're watching on YouTube. Yeah, please. Yeah, it's a nice place you got here, Mr. Kramer. <laughs> Man can really get some thinking done. It's great. And yeah, we're still right here, like Mike said, in Greenville, Delahue, Delawat, Delaware. Uh, now, the reason why we're here today, um, Mike and his team at Florigistics just got back uh, from doing a show. Did the big foam show uh, up in Michigan. Foam Expo. Foam Expo. And, and I know that some of the people, some of our friends inside the industry, this is a topic that comes up all the time whenever we're, we're talking with people. Say, hey, are you headed to uh, Fabtech? Fabtech's coming up in the fall, right? Or, uh, you know, or Wolfie's probably going to Comic Con. Some of the <laughs> stuff that you, you guys are doing. Um, if somebody is, is planning on going to a show, I know there's a certain gritting of the teeth where we're like, hey, you think about going, oh, I don't know if I'm going to go to that one, or are you going to exhibit? Um, there's a couple ways you can approach trade shows, Mike. What are they? I think, you know, it's kind of funny. You described it really accurately, Nick, in terms of when I talk to customers about shows, and I know you talk to people about them also, Francesca, is a lot of people look at a show and they're like, oh, and they just get, you know, be clamped by the thought of, of being involved in a show, but what we really want to dispel today is really two different ways to approach a show okay. that really aren't a ton of work, but can create a lot of opportunity and understanding as well. And, and I think the first way we'll one is like the easiest way, which is mm -hmm. just walking a show. And I gotta say, I've walked hundreds of shows probably in my career, and we've exhibited a bunch, but I never exhibit until I walk a show, yeah. at least once, because I want to get a feel of the, of the venue, the setup, the professionalism of the people that are setting it up and, and hosting the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then obviously what the show's all about in terms of who's exhibiting, who's walking around and all that type of thing. So, you know, we probably, between all the sales team, we probably walk 15, 20 shows a year. Wow. Um, just to stay current, to have a good understanding of what's happening in the industry. Maybe it's an industry that we're already participating in and we want to just keep a pulse on it. Or it could be something like an EV show that Chris Lord went to where he just wanted to learn more and try to understand where there might be problems where Teflon coatings are a solution. Okay. So that's really what we're after when we're, when we're going to shows. And, you know, we went to Foam Expo, I think, probably three or four years, and we walked it. And then we decided, hey, let's have a, let's have a booth because it's now co-exhibiting with the adhesive show. So now it's kind of like a two-for-one deal for us because Teflon can solve problems in both those markets. So we thought it was worthwhile to, to try to do it, which kind of leads into having a booth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a good way to kind of put your foot in the water, too. It's a little gentler on the wallet if you're going to walk it, right? Very and much it's, so. And it's, a, it's easier for, uh, on the calendar, too. You say, oh, I can pop into this one for a day, and it's not a three-day commitment like when you're exhibiting. That's right. And, and, you know, we're fortunate enough to have customers in every city across the U.S. and Canada. So if we're going to Indianapolis or L.A. or Houston or wherever for a show, we can also – connect visits with customers and really make it a very efficient, economical use of scouting time, so to speak, for these shows. Okay. Okay. So, you know, it's a great opportunity to, to get something back, uh, you know, whether you're walking or exhibiting, returning on your investment, but it's important to do it right. So you guys are really, you're really savvy in this area. I'm not just saying that. Um, 
as far as if I'm looking at the calendar and I'm looking at the map for the year, I want to pick the right show. What goes into selecting the right show to attend, Francesca? There's a lot that can go into it. Um, but I think before you start doing any of the obvious stuff of where it is and how much it costs and things like that, you need to know why you're actually going to the show. And let's say exhibiting mm-hmm. specifically, because that's going to be the bigger investment. Right. So you need to have a goal for this show Otherwise, you're going to go and not know if you had a successful show or not. So is the goal to get new leads? Is the goal to raise brand awareness? Is the goal to break into a new market? Is the goal to, you know, impress um, and, and be an influencer in a certain industry or world? Whatever it is, make sure that goal is crystal clear before you even sign up to have a booth there. Yep. So, you know, you can go to the foam and adhesive show and say, our goal is after we've walked this for a few years, we see that this is an opportunity. We think we can get some new customers. So knowing that that's our goal, we can prepare to exhibit a very specific way. Yeah, I think a lot of what I think of is the value of a new customer or a new opportunity. And what is that? And so I go into a show and say, how many new customers am I going to need to offset the cost of? Exhibiting at the show, travel to and from the show, Wolfie's bar tab, yeah, all those things all have to factor into the total cost of the show, amount of new business coming in, and what's the reality of achieving a good ROI from that. Right. That's ultimately what it comes down to. And from our customer standpoint, it's, it, they know the value of a job. And if they're in a certain market and they say, hey, every time we get a new job, it's X amount of new dollars. If you think you can get three or four new jobs from going to that show, go. If you need 100 new jobs, don't, don't go. go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very true. And I think what, one thing that helps with deciding whether to go or not and whether that ROI exists is knowing who your audience is. So when you're going to exhibit at this show, who else is going to be there? Are you there to network with the other exhibitors because those are the people with money and maybe that's who you need to reach? Or are you going to you know, get your customers from the audience in terms of the walkers of the show. Who is it? Yep. So you've got to know who is there. Is it the engineers, the decision makers? Is it your, your C-suite? Is it job shops? What is happening at that show? Who is there? So make sure your goal and your audience are crystal clear yep. in order to make sure you have that ROI on a spend of exhibiting at a show. Nailed it. I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, it, it's important, too, because I'm thinking of... of uh, you know, friends in the industry, you can also do what you did with the foam show and like pr- pick a particular industry or target right there, right? Like yep. say if I, I'm looking into aerospace or something like that, I would want to look at maybe space tech out in Anaheim or whatever. So exactly. th- we, we, people need to know there are these niche kind of industry focuses out there too. And I think those are the ones where you can really get a lot of bang for your buck in uh-huh. terms of getting to the audience that you need to deliver your value to. You think about a Teflon coder, they deliver a very niche solution sure. to a specific audience. So if you, the more granular you can get on a show where that audience is going to be, even if it's a small show, mm-hmm. that's even better because now they're going to make their way around. There's like, go to Fabtech and you better plan on three days of just walking the show once. And by the time that people get to you in day two, they're brain dead. Yep. <laughs> so that's the problem with those really big shows. Yeah, that's like West. such a great opportunity because yeah. you have to be there. It's the one. It's like, mm, not necessarily. What's your goal? Yeah. Who's, who do you need in your audience? Yeah. yeah. And are they even at the show or are right. they just entertaining after hours? So that's, that's the other part of it. So, you know, there's a lot of nuances that we can talk about forever. But if you're yeah. thinking about an audience going to a show and you're on the fence between should I exhibit or just walk, give us a call. We'll be glad to help you through this and tell you some tips that we've learned over the years. Yeah, so, for sure. Great offer for our audience. Yeah. I, I, Freebie. I think, I think it's important, <laughs> though, just because I can make a quick flight to Chicago um, and I can afford it, Fabtech might not be for everybody simply right. because it's – the size, right? That's right. an enormous spectacle of a show. Right. Uh, this is all uh, great stuff for our audience to consider. Let's say I've got my show picked out, ready to go. Um, right. Well, I'm not ready to go. What what goes into? I've been fortunate enough to work uh, several shows with the two of you. Um, how do you start that preparation before you go to a show, Mike? 
I think if you take it all the way back to the basics and assume that you don't have a booth, because a lot of I think a lot of our customers don't really have a booth. Okay. It all comes down to like what your design is going to be in your booth, and it, and is it going to be a booth a ten by ten that you're gonna, you have a booth you're using, or you're going to buy a generic booth, or are you going to do pull up posters that you're going to have very direct messaging. So it's really to me it, it's like four months out probably minimum if at least of yeah. thinking through wh what's our presence going to be people walk by your booth they're going to look at you and very quickly make an assessment and, and a judgment on whether you're a fit or not so you can if you're too general then you you get inundated with people who are asking who you are and what you do if you're too specific you might push some people away mm -hmm. but honestly those people you're pushing away probably you want to push away anyway Right. So, you know, there's a real balance of booth layout, design, all that kind of stuff that really needs to be considered and brainstormed. And then you, if you're designing new stuff, you need to factor in time for the design, reiterations of that, getting it printed, getting it everything in-house in time to ship to the show in advance. So there's a lot that like, yeah, four months might not be enough. Yeah. It probably is closer to six months. Yeah, ideally. Yeah. So a lot. There's a lot of preparation just in terms of getting that booth presence ready uh all that yeah it comes and that's just that's just you with the stuff that's within your control totally there's also the other things that every trade show has to make you have to make decisions on like within that booth does it come with tables does it come with chairs does it come with uh oh, yeah. you know is it a 10 foot table is it a little high top table what works best for your booth and designing your booth, you've got to do that around what's also included by the trade show and what you need to purchase. Well, you need do to you need to have electricity? Yeah. yeah. Do you need to have electricity? Do you need to have Wi-Fi? Do you need to have lead capture the um, tools? Do you need to have... I'm sure that Wi-Fi always works. Oh, it's, it's yeah. yet to <laughs> work. On the trade show floor? <laughs> <laughs> I think I watch Succession while I'm there. Um, <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of little pieces that are both um, something that you have to talk about with your creative design team and with your salespeople. And then there's also people that, there are things that you have to arrange with the booth, with the show people as right. well. The shipping. third party people. Exactly. Yeah. So you do have to allot time for both of those things. Yeah, it's a you lot. Know? And then lastly, whatever you're going to have at the booth, like giveaways, things to leave behind for people to take away. And, you know, I, we used to be really big on having like a whole bunch of stuff and we'd haul a bunch of panels to the shows. And like, yeah. it's honestly, it's a lot of people that, just take it and put it in their bags. We call them the collectors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, and that never amounts to anything. The people that I've seen that are the best leads from shows don't take anything. Right. Yeah. They don't take anything. They don't even, sometimes they don't have cards. They're just there, low profile, stealth walking the show. Right. They don't want to get inundated right. by a bunch of like hawkers and people yeah. yelling at them. So, an episode of Tchotchke Hunters. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's an important thing. But you do want to have some stuff there to, to give away and, so you may have to design some things or have some brochures or give leave behind type things. And that's fine, but just I wouldn't make too big of a deal of it in this age. Yeah, and that does factor into, again, your audience and your goal. You yeah. know, so design whatever you're going to have out around those things. It's like, who is this for and what do you want them to do with it? So make sure that where whatever they're taking away from you, they know what the next step should be should they want to take it with you after they're away from you. Yep. So you got to make sure it's memorable, it's clear, it hits on what their needs are, and then they know exactly what to do next if they like what you have to say. Yep. Yeah, yeah and just don't do the whole, like, I don't know. I think the giveaways of, like, the <laughs> koozies and the lanyards and the magnets, and not the pens, always have pens. <laughs> but I think that tchotchke stuff is played in a lot of ways because you're just going to get some looky lose tchotchke collectors looky lose the jaws they're reference there. they're there for sure no they certainly are but i, I like that you both like you, you said needs mike said necessities i'm glad that you you both focused on that stuff because i think it's important for people to know that they don't have to have jugglers there <laughs> and booth girls or chase utley signing autographs because mike never greenlit that i always wanted him yeah. in our booth <laughs> Um, that, that you have to have, you had to put your base, you know, put your best face forward. And here's where I wanted to take this next: um, be ready to work, right? Because uh, there, there, ha work. there has to be. I think there's a misconception out there. It's like, well, you know, we're going to a trade show. It's it's in New York City. Well, yeah, or it's in Las Vegas. Yeah, okay. Um, you got to know that these things are work, right, Mike? I mean, I I have to say, at the end of a even a short, like, three-day show, I'm beat. 
<laughs> from the time you're standing on your feet all day, walking, you're in your booth and walking around. Because you, just because you're doing the show doesn't mean you anchor in your booth. You still need to yeah. walk the show yourself. Yeah. Then you combine that with happy hour type stuff, dinners, some drinks. Like it's a lot of go- lot going on. It's a lot of peopling. It, it <laughs> is. There is a lot of people in Francesca, but like as far as working, what do people need to be prepared to do? Because if you're just standing there, you're going to stick out. Like right. these people are not confident. They don't have a message. What do people need to consider? It's a really good point because I think as much work as it takes to build your booth and design it and pick the show and get everything there, the actual working does happen in the booth. And you do that by having a plan for who's going to be in the booth and when. So we like to make sure that there are shifts ready if you have enough people to take shifts and if you want to do that. But think about it. Is it like you're, who's going to be taking a lunch and how long can you actually be on your feet and at your best versus I'm going to be doing a lap because now that I see this opportunity, I'm going to see if it's out there or elsewhere. Yep. You know, there's, there's some sort of um, on the spot snap calls that you need to make there in terms, but you need to have the plan before you actually just wing it and just do whatever. The other thing is, is that when you are in the booth, you better have something very relevant, quick, easy to understand to say when people ask you their questions. Elevator pitch. There it is. Got to have the elevator pitch. Mm-hmm. If you don't, and not, I'm not talking about a salesy, pushy thing, but I'm saying you need to quickly, efficiently say who you are, why you're here, and who you help. So get your elevator pitch down before you walk into that show. And when you're in your booth, smile, be ready and willing to, to engage with people. The thing with that elevator pitch, just to build off what you said, Francesca, to me, my whole thing is exactly what you said and then flipping it back to them as quickly as I can to figure out who they are and are they going to be a fit or not. Because there's nothing worse than when you're sitting there getting interrogated by somebody who you don't even know who they are. And then when you finally right. turn it around to them, they're not even legit in your it's industry. It's a competitor. <laughs> oh, it's awful. So elevator pitch, turn it back on them and Good. quickly get Good. through that one. Great point to bring up, Mike, because I think everybody is con- conscious of that. Like, ooh, are they, are they sniffing me out to see if, they're, yep. if I'm legit? you got to be able to put that right back on them. Like, yeah, here's me. Yeah. What who about are you? you? And yeah. I think... You know, then that lets you know whether you want to, if you, if you want to scan them in, mm-hmm. give them stuff, because tons of people come up and hey, scan me in. <laughs> and you can scan everybody in the show in if you want, but it's going to make the next step post-show really hard. Yes. So I've gotten over time, and that was my thing. When I was younger starting this off, I would come back and I'd be like, yeah, look at all <laughs> these leads. And then I didn't realize how much work it was afterwards. So yeah. now I've gotten really picky about <laughs> scanning people in. Yeah, like, because you want it to be worth something, mm-hmm. worth your time to scan and follow up. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I'm putting I, you both on the spot. Uh, Fr- Frank can detect this now in post-production. Truth bombs. <laughs> Truth bomb time. Bring it. Do you ever fake scan anybody? I have absolutely fake scanned. Mike? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's I'm a big fan of a fake scan if you need to <laughs> get them on their way. So then you don't have to do the old follow-up. So a couple things about the booth, though. The, <laughs> I'm also a proponent of, like, you want to be engaging as a booth, so to speak. Yeah. So we try to stand on the outside. I'm a, I stand in the aisle half the time, I think, because you want to, like, welcome people in the booth. You don't want – some people come to the edge of your booth and think, like, they can't step over that line. <laughs> and yeah. so if everybody's Disappear. in the back of the booth hanging out, that's not a good look. So just be engaging, let – you know, hang out. But at the same time, don't have everybody sitting on their phones or on their laptops or three people eating lunch with food all over your face. Like, eat lunch out of the booth. If you need to do work out of the booth, leave the booth. Like, yeah. you don't want it to look like that because I, the people next to us at Foam Expo, they had posters. They had two posters. And they, two people were on, behind both posters on their laptops. So it looks like no one's in the booth. Meanwhile, they're just doing work. I'm like, why did you come? Like, stay home if that's all you're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. There's, weird. That is odd. It's and weird. You're totally right about that. That's where any... shifts come in. Yes. Yeah. Like if I know I'm working for two hours and I have an hour off, I'll handle my work outside. I'll eat outside the booth. And, you know, it makes it a lot cleaner. Yeah. Staying in the, the booth for a second, if I can throw this at you one more. Do you have any booth etiquette that you would pass on, like things to not do? Because I, I have one like like blasting music or, or something like that kind of thing. Or I know Mike likes when people just show up and sit 
in his booth oh. for no reason whatsoever. I mean, there are certain things you don't do, right? Because you want to be kind to your neighbor exhibitor or something like that, right? I mean, honestly, it's pretty common sense, but you see <laughs> fouls You'd think. everywhere but, when you're walking around a show. And, and I know the three of us were walking a show once, and we couldn't even get to the booth because they had they had it wedged with like 14 guys that were all standing around. Yeah. Remember? <laughs> like, you know which one I'm talking yes, about. I do. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was like a protein shake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty. A protein shake. It was a protein shake. I was thinking of like just carrying around a referee's wallet, giving giving a booth a yellow card. Then they go too far, throw the red. Yeah, because because you know you gotta you gotta have some people to appreciate have some that. etiquette, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean we're all there to work, so be a good you know coworker essentially yeah. in this shared space. We're there to work, right? Show's over, ship everything, pack it up. Uh, this was always my, my the interesting part because you kind of get home, you're in rugged shape from keeping that pace, uh, you know, and, and Monday morning hits. What do you do? Mike, post-show, you, you were, you were kind of the, the, the king of this. You have your routine ready to go, and what do you get into as soon as you get back to work? So right this is a show? lesson I learned from Tony Abato. Um, hey, like when back. you get home from the show, that's when the work starts. Yeah. That's where you – get your ROI. That's where you figure out whether you're going to do the show next year or not. Mm-hmm. Like that, that all comes after the show. And, and so it's a matter of now having a strategy of what to do with those leads you have. And if you have a lot of them, then like just sending one email to everybody you scanned in, don't expect too much. Yeah. And so the more you do to pre-qualify people and keep good notes when you're scanning people in, the easier it makes it to call them back mm-hmm. afterwards and say, Hey, we met at the show. You talked with me. You talked with Nick. You talked with Francesca or Frank. Like, but we wanted to see if we can carry on the conversation, whatever it's going to be. But you've got notes, and immediately you just stood out from everybody else at that show because most people, number one, aren't going to call back. They're definitely not going to call. Yeah. Most people aren't going to follow up, and they're not going to know anything about the conversation they had. So I think that's been like probably the, a really strong thing that I've taken away, and we've all seen it. Absolutely. How it works and how it doesn't work if you do it the wrong way, and you just mass e market people, and that hit rate is so low that you'll never justify the show. It's still a higher hit rate than doing nothing, which I think a lot of people <laughs> still do. Yeah. So that you have all these leads, you're, and you just let them kind of add to your email list and then drift by the wayside, and never have any kind of you know relationship built from any solid foundation. This is a great opportunity. You met in person. You know something about these people. So if you have a lot of them, definitely sort them. You know who are your A's, who are your B's, who are your C leads, and then develop a follow up plan that matches the opportunity cost for that. So I definitely think you can call people um, that are great opportunities potentially, fish those out, maybe even the bees. But you can also develop a whole e-marketing campaign around follow-up where very early on you send stuff about the show and then it's, hey, I wanted to let you know that this was happening. You can keep engaging with very little effort if you can automate your contacts for the ones that are maybe not as hot of a lead, but you want to nurture them because you don't know. Maybe a show you went to two years ago has a lead that will now pay off because they were waiting to do whatever they needed to do to work with you. Yeah, that long game is big in the coding's world, honestly, because to find people who might be customers down the road is hard to do. And because most people that don't come to, that come to your booth aren't ready, aren't usually in the buying cycle at that moment, right. but they might be in a couple of years, like Francesco was saying. So to play that long game and to not hard press people, it just establishes your company and yourself as a as a solution provider that when they're ready, they know they can come back to you. And that's that's what we're after, for at least from the floor logistics, from the coding's supply standpoint, is we want to build those long term relationships and establish the foundation of of solution, basically. Yeah. So I guess when I come back and I've got my two stacks of business cards, yeah. I got this stack that I'm going to probably ignore. And then I've got that smaller stack of like, mm, I, think, I think these are legit, mm-hmm. right? Uh, could you speak to this for the Deliver More audience, both of you? Like if, if I have, I, th- I think you've said this before, Mike, sometimes it takes one good lead. You can justify getting to that show, right? And then that would help you decide if I'm going to go back to the foam show or, or space tech, correct? Right. That's, that's exactly it. That's the ROI we talked about at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And, and, we, and it is, like, honestly, we go at it and say one good lead 
is enough to pay for the show. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really what it is. Now, does that happen all the time? No. Does it take a couple years to, to pan out? That's usually it, especially in the industrial coatings world. From concept to fruition is measured in years, not months. Ooh. So you have to take a, a leap of faith sometimes in these shows and say, we had a lot of traffic. We had a lot of great conversations. Our pipeline is... Is, is moving along, yeah. we think this is a show we want to do again. Or the converse of that is we went to the show, we stood around too much, we walked the show, talked to the other exhibitors, and got everything we could out of them. It's just not, it's not for us. It's not the right audience for us. Right. And that's okay, too, because now you take that off your list. Yeah, it's also valuable information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, the easiest thing to do is to follow up with everybody by email and then drop them after a very short amount of time. Mm. But think about like, especially for coders, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of people could be collecting your information because they have a solution now, but in case their solution pr fails, they now have you as the backup. Mm -hmm. So I think you kind of need to be ready to answer that call no matter what, and you need to stay in their top of mind and as a reference for them by continuing to engage, even if the engagement's just minimal. It's once a month, once mm -hmm. every two months or so. There's not that much work involved. Like you, you said that earlier, it's the nurture part. Right. And that's, that's the part that I like about a lot of this is, continuing to establish and educate people about solutions and value that you can bring to the table, whether it's what I'm doing from Florogistics or whether it's what the audience does in terms of coding parts. Mm -hmm. and, and there's going to be hiccups in the supply chain. And if you're there to help pick up that slack, then because that's they remember you, that's when it pays off. So to continue to do those things in the long term, that's, that's exactly where we're believers in. Yeah, we have a pretty comprehensive rundown it's uh, a lot of, of what uh, our audience should consider. Um, but even even so, things get overlooked, Francesca. Always. Things get overlooked. What are some other considerations uh, that need to be brought up in this conversation? So I think a lot of people overlook some of the education sessions, some of the speakers that are in the show or Absolutely. at the show. And you can get valuable information. You can build a valuable network. If these guys are speakers, that's probably because Maybe it's because they paid to speak. But even so, that could be a good person to have as, um, we call them swim coaches, somebody that can refer business to you. It could be um, somebody whose group that your circle you want to break into. So you can go to the sessions and get to network with the speakers, with other people in the audience. You could also try and speak at these shows because now you are the person people are trying to get to. I know, public speaking, it's not for everyone. But... It could be a huge like win because those stage side leads, those people that come up to you afterwards and say, so I had a question that I didn't want to ask when you asked if there were any questions. Mm -hmm. Now you've got them and they trust, you have this implicit trust and authority because yeah. of who you were in that room. Yeah, a good example of that is I, I spoke as a 15 minute talk at the Foam Expo. I had as many leads from the talk part of it when they scan people in when they come into the talk, there was as many from the talk as there was from the booth. So, I mean, it was, it was there, and they were, they were good leads. Yeah. It's so, great because they're raising yeah. their hand to be in the room for the subject you're talking about. Right. So they've pre-qualified themselves yep. by just being in the room, potentially. Yeah. So definitely speaking is a big piece yeah. of that. Same with, like, sponsorships. There's a way to do sponsors. I'm eh, not a big fan of those. Eh, it's kind of vanity. Yeah. Stuff for well, me. It just raises the bar on how much ROI you need, how many new business you need. Because if you tack on ten grand of sponsorship, that's that's like now you have more customers, more new customers you need from the show. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you're right. Let's say there's a. How do you determine? You know, is the three hundred dollar yacht party uh, the networking uh, on, stuff? on day one? Is it worth going? Be how honest, you, Mike. How do you determine? Yeah, that? So I mean, you guys know where I like I've never. If, if the networking thing is at the show, and I, I usually will stick around and have a beer or two, um, but to pay money to go off-site is usually people that aren't really, they either all know each other because they're all in the circle. It's, it's tough. I think that one's tough. And usually, honestly, I'm kind of beat from being at the show all day. Yeah. And the, the thought of going and being locked down for another networking event for two hours afterwards, it's kind of overwhelming. With <laughs> the same people that you just were networking right. with. So I can see it making sense. Uh, again, this comes up with 
scheduling shifts, you can have somebody that is designated to go to that networking event to, to have a goal if you know who the audience is. That's what we did in Vegas. Gonna be. Yeah. Because so, we were fresh. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So definitely consider that. The other, you know, the other part of that, Nick, is like I'm a big fan of like wherever the host hotels are for these shows is I try to stay there because the, to me the best place to network is in hotel bar. Yeah. Because that's where people are, are like their guards down. They're there just like unwinding and then you roll up and it's just a casual conversation and i felt i feel so much like, more organic oh it's way better and so i think in terms of networking i feel like that is more bang for your buck than doing some of that like scheduled formal events yeah it's also a little bit kinder to your your body too right because you <laughs> not everybody has to, to participate in every little event i remember right. ta talking to people last time i went to, to vegas with with frank and people say hey you guys didn't go to the after 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 party but like, no we worked from 8 a.m to 5 p.m and, and you know and 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 then we went to the hotel bar and we, we saw some people made some contacts set some things up for the next day um it, i think it's important to let people know that too you can't be everywhere all at once sure you absolutely know? <laughs> exhausting yeah it, it, it <laughs> that is. Would, that's a lot yeah yeah i think um the other thing that you want to think about and this especially i think for women it is what to wear at a trade show mm. and i have to say the most important thing is the shoes the shoes have to be comfortable enough to stand around and and thank you to generation zoomer Whoever decided that white sneakers are in with everything now, so <laughs> you can easily look fashionable and stay comfortable. But That's yeah, a good point. I you need have to make sure. That. Like, is the is the room exceptionally cold? Is it exceptionally hot? Are you going to need layers? Are you going to be comfortable? Do you look professional? Does everybody wear the same thing? Do you coordinate colors? How you're presenting is important, not just in your booth, but in yourself and yeah. the employees in the booth. Great point. Yeah. I know it's also important too, and we've had some really good success this way too of saying like just inform people where you're going to be going and say, oh no, we saw on social that you were going to be here. Yes. You put that up on your account that you were going to be at the lobby or in this in this session or something like that too. So being forthcoming with that information is always never important. hurts. I yeah, mean, if it makes for one connection that you wouldn't have got otherwise, it's worth doing that. Yeah, I always like to tell people that we, that um, somebody's going to a show before the show. You can tag the show. Yeah. The show appreciates that in your social. And that's like leading up to it. Then at the show, it's great to be snapping pictures, posting on social in real time, maybe even going live or doing something like that so that you can yeah. say, I am here. So other people who are at that show can see that. Mm -hmm. and, th and then your audience is seeing that you're active. You're very much a leader in this kind of space. And then after the show, you do want to do at least one or two posts about what you thought of the show, what your favorite takeaway was, what was memorable. Because again, the more that you are associated with that kind of event, the more people are going to see you as a big deal from that event or the authority of that event. Right. And so you seem more accessible, more, um, I guess, approachable, so that people can, even if they didn't get around to talking to you, they'll be like, hey, I saw you were at that show and I meant to talk to you, but I couldn't. So wanted to reach out and ask this. Yeah, so let people know. I think just, I know we're getting close on time. Yeah. One thing yeah. I did notice is when you do a show multiple times, and we've done this, mm -hmm. You, you develop, like, people that are maybe in, you don't talk to in year one will be like, I saw you here last year, or I saw you here for the last few years. And it develops a real credibility yes. and trust factor almost that you continue to invest in the industry and participate in the industry, and which almost, like you said, gives you that implicit trust. Mm -hmm. So something to keep in mind. Absolutely. And something I think that, that our audience should keep in mind, too, they, they said it before, um, get in touch with these two. If you do have questions that, that, that involve prepping for, for shows like this um, or just looking for, for insight on this kind of thing, get in, they can get in touch with both of you, correct? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Francesca at intechmkt.com. There you go. All right. <laughs> uh, final thoughts, guys. This has been great. I, I thank uh, Mike uh, Floragistics. Thanks for, for having us up here in a new location of Deliver More. It feels good to get the band back together. Been a little bit, huh? Yeah. I mean, me, you, Francesca, and uh, producer extraordinaire. The man behind the camera. Rago. Frank Rago is here, and it, it just feels good to have everybody all hands on deck here. So uh, huge thanks to Florigistics for uh, letting us uh, do this in this space, Mike. It's a pleasure. And look for more new topics. We've got a lot of really fun things coming up in the fall. And yeah. 
your feedback's always welcome too. I know Francesca talks about it a lot, but you know, if you have ideas for a show, we shape our ideas around your feedback. So please let us know if you have ideas for what we could be talking about or exploring down the road. Yeah, good summertime edition of Delivermore. Francesca, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to see you next time right here from Greenville, Delahue, Delawat, Delaware on Delivermore. Bye-bye now. Bye.